to discuss the marks of the church, briefly discuss what the mission of the church is. We're going to look at church membership. Is that a thing? And we're going to begin with Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to briefly discuss the foundation of our understanding of our doctrine of the church, which is Christ as head and the church as his body. Ephesians chapter 4. Ripping stuff over there, Samuel. I don't even know. Whoa! I know these. I know these scriptures. All righty, Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse one. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints of the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves. And carried about by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. So this is sort of our foundation. Uh, You can call this the whole Christ, head and body. And last week I mentioned that word totus Christus, and that's what this means. St. Augustine first said it. So when we consider the whole Christ, we are considering head and body. And this is the foundational element to our, uh, how we understand what the church is. We, it is connected to Christ. It is the body of Christ. As Paul says in Ephesians 1.23, he says, The body of Christ is the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the body is the fullness of him, and he fills all in all. It's a pretty amazing statement. I think of Song of Solomon where where it says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. This is the same Christ who is our head that calls us friends even in John 15, 15. As Sam was just talking about. Friends. No longer do I call you servants, but I have called you friends. So because the church is the body of Christ, the church is growing up as it is as long as it's working properly, as it says. Growing up, joined and held together by every joint, and it's building itself up in love until we reach that mature manhood, that mature stature of the fullness of Christ. So when you think of the church, you think of the body of Christ, and we're being built up. And you can think of Romans chapter 8, we are being conformed to the image of Christ. That is the church becoming more and more like our Lord. And one day when the church sees Him face to face on that final judgment day, we will all become like Him. Finally. So, this is the church. The body of Christ. What are its marks? 
Okay. What are the marks of the church? What do you think? Throw stuff out. Preaching of the word. Preaching of the word. Throw it out and I'll tell you which ones are right. <laughs> okay. Ready of the word, reaching out to others. Church discipline. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Worship and other words. Okay, all right, all right. All right, we got them all, basically. We got them all. Uh, traditionally, they would be uh, spoken of in this way. The pure proclamation of God's word. The pure proclamation of God's word. The pure administration of the sacraments. Okay, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Purely administrative. And the faithful exercise of discipline. Those are the marks of the church. Calvin would have just had the first two. Pure proclamation of God's word and the sacraments. Um, most in the Reformed tradition will recognize that really the word of God and the pure proclamation is the chief. Because if you're, if you're doing that correctly, you're going to administer the sacraments correctly. And you're going to be doing church discipline because the Bible clearly says it. Right, so that is the chief. Uh, but when you want to look at a church and want to see if it has three kind of marks, and, or if you could look at the New Testament and say, what are the three kind of chief things that a good church needs to have, that a true church needs to have? And it's the sacraments as Jesus has instituted them, the pure word, the pure gospel, and elders must be elders and discipline. So how do we think about this? How can we prove this from Scripture? Or, or how, you know, let, let's look at some texts here. Uh, Matthew 28, 18 will, I think, take care of the first two. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came, came up and spoke to them, saying, as we all know, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All right, so Jesus says, go make disciples, then set up these word and sacrament ministries. It's one way you can summarize that. Go set up these word and sacrament ministries. And all of this really makes sense as the marks of the church, because when you think of what the word is, what is the word? It's the foundation of the faith. You can't have the faith, and therefore you can't have a church without the word. Um, the two ordinances of the New Covenant are the Lord's Supper and Baptism. Those are chief ordinances. Those are the ordinances that God has, these sacraments that God has given to the New Covenant people. So, of course, that would be a mark of his people. As he says here, go and baptize them. Go and baptize them. Teach them all, I, all that I have commanded. Right? And discipline, as I spoke of last week, how can you have a society without admission into that society or excommunication out of that society. How is that even a society? Maybe some uh, radical liberals in our culture would disagree with me on that. But I think to have a society, you need to have an admission process and an excommunication process. And so how could the church without that be a church? I don't think it can. That's a popular thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. to have, uh, we don't have membership. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just want you to come as you are. And yeah, church without walls. Yeah. It's not turning out too good in Europe. So, we have the word, sacraments, discipline. Now, how this is an important question when we think about this. Notice I said the pure proclamation of God's word, the pure administration of sacraments. So, how many errors in teaching can a church have that it still falls into this category? So you're saying you can't be a true church, Nick, if you don't purely administer the sacraments? So you're saying Baptists aren't true churches? Like what, what is the point there? How, how would you guys answer that? What, what, is, what is too much error? As, as fallen people, our churches are never going to be 100% pure. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But I think a uh, 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 striving for PCA, they recognize baptism even if it comes from, from uh, 
someone outside your nomination, even if it's if from through a, a Roman Catholic or, or a denomination that does not teach Correct. Uh, only the Word of God. So. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, let's read what Calvin says about this. It's on your sheet. This is cloudy, quoting Calvin. Anyway, so there's actually a quote from Cloudy, actually. I take that. Calvin said, as long as the grand doctrine of religion is not injured and the basic articles of faith are not suppressed, a church can be a true church. Okay? And we still have the question what are the basic articles of faith? <laughs> What are the basic articles of faith? What do you guys think? When you think of the essentials, things that you have to believe to be a Christian, what do you think of? The divinity of Christ. Divinity of Christ, good. The word is uh, fully trustworthy. Okay. <laughs> Justification by faith. Okay. The Trinity. The nature of God, yeah. Nature of God, yeah. Okay. I said the divinity of Christ, the resurrection also. I mean, the different. resurrection of Christ. Yeah. Jesus actually had a body, the humanity of Christ. You know, because there are some li radical liberal churches that will say, yeah, he was fully divine. But he, he, when he walked through the sand, you couldn't see his footsteps. He was just a spiritual being. He didn't actually rise from the dead. That's all metaphor, theological language. So you have to have the humanity of Christ as well. I, I would just throw there the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. Yeah. Okay. So we, we all kind of know what we're talking about here. We all kind of know. You know, if a Christian came up to you and was like, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I, you know, I, I'm a Trinitarian, just like you. I just disagree on uh, baptism, and I don't think the Lord's Supper does exactly what you think it does. Uh, no one in this room would think, oh, you're a heretic. None of us, at least, maybe some radical people. No, 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 one, no one would think because we all kind of know, yeah, but it's good to articulate, right? And and I, I think one of the first things you do to articulate this question is go to the ancient creeds of the church. I think that's probably the first thing you go do. <clears throat> all right, grand doctrine of religion that religion is not injured. Basic articles of faith are not suppressed. The, the Westminster Confession talks it talks about it this way, more like a dimmer switch. True churches and false churches being like a dimmer switch. There is a point in which they're synagogues of Satan, the confession says. Uh, but the rest of them, as long as the grand doctrine of religion is not injured, there's a, it's like a dimmer switch. The churches are more or less pure at different times even. Okay? And I think that is the best way to look, to look at that. Um, now what about church discipline? Let's look at church discipline for a moment. Go to Matthew 16. This is sort of the foundation of, of church discipline. Remember, the, the, sort of the, the basic idea of church discipline is the Christian church is a community, a society, and you need elders at the doors to say you are admitted into the fellowship or you are not. And if you don't abide by these rules, in other words, if you do not have faith or you err in some grievous way, like in 1 Corinthians 5, having sex with your mother or stepmother, then you are out of the fellowship. Or you have to have that for it to be a society. So this is sort of the foundation of that. Matthew 16, 13. <clears throat> now when Jesus came into the district of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, uh, shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So without getting into uh, the discussion of what this rock is, there are some Reformed people that do think he was referring to Pete, Peter and therefore the apostles and then elders like that. Or, um, or 
the rock here is the profession that Peter says, not Peter himself. That's another option, but we're not getting into that today. That's not the point. The point is, Peter, in 1 Peter, calls himself a fellow elder. Okay, so when the apostles passed away, who continues that leadership? Pastors and elders, right? Uh, So what was given to Peter, a fellow elder and apostle? He was more than we are elders, but he was a fellow elder. And what does it say here? The keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the confession says. The elders are given the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be... Uh, shall, um, sorry, I lost my place. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. In other words, you have the keys to admit and to excommunicate. You have the keys to admit and excommunicate. I think it's important to look also a couple of pages later, Matthew 18, where Jesus says that again. Uh, yeah. He's talking about discipline there, and he says uh, in chapter 18, verse 17, if, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, or whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So he uses it there in a strictly uh, disciplinary uh, you know, setting. Right. right. That's good. That's all. All right, so given these marks, uh, let's briefly talk about what are some godly reasons to leave a church. Think about the marks of the church. Um, What are some good reasons to leave a church? I'm sure we've all experienced people uh, that may leave the church because the uh, music wasn't that good, as good as they would want. Is that a good, is that a really a good reason to walk away from a church? Or how should we think through these things? Um, tell me stuff. The doctrine, though, I mean, one of the foundations that you're talking about, they're teaching that uh, Jesus was a good teacher, but no more. If it's a, a, a foundational doctrine, uh, then that, I mean, that's, that's reason for leaving. But because, as happened here, the session that unanimously voted to serve wine and grape juice, people left the church over that. It's really sad when churches have disagreements. I would, I would say probably most disagreements are not doctrinal. They're about petty things. Yeah, and the New Testament warns against that. Like, God knew that that was going to be an issue. Uh, James talks a lot about quarreling. And elsewhere in the New Testament, stop quarreling. Stop having these little fights among you about things that don't actually matter. Okay? Enough. My, the, the church, that when we were kids, I mean, I don't remember much about it, but my dad came to Christ. And one of us brought home a full coloring page that had a mountain. And Buddha was going up one path, and Jesus was this path, and Muhammad. And when he saw that, he said, we need to find another church. Yeah. This is that's good this is not good. That's a good reason to go to the military. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's, 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 it's something I look at case by case, right? Yeah. If, if, as a believer, I feel like I would have some responsibility to try and, you know, make a stand for the truth. Um, you know, approach the, the leadership, but you know, there's probably not going to go anywhere, but we still have a responsibility to at least speak the truth and, and try to uh, persuade. Uh, you know, but yeah. if, if that doesn't work, then you know, we got to leave. But there, there are still, even in the, the PCUSA denomination that the PCA uh, came out of, there are still very conservative pastors and elders in the PCUSA who believe, you know, with conviction that they Chosen. need to be there to, Chosen to, stay. to be the, the voice of reason and to continue to uphold the authority of Scripture. But, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. That was very very difficult. Difficult. you gotta, you got to follow uh, your conscience. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of Bonhoeffer's story in Germany during World War II. That, uh, you know, the the Nazis were forcing all these changes in doctrine, but he was trying to do what he could. Mm-hmm. 
But you know, the other side of that is those churches that are not preaching the pure doctrine, they have elders too. Mm -hmm. And are these elders thinking that if you're not in agreement that what they they bind and what they lose is really going to, you know, there's a, there's another side to that. Mm -hmm. There's a side of the church that they may be saying, okay, we are elders and we're reading the same thing. But if they are not facing that binding and loosening scripturally, then, then they've got a real problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and you know, the that's why that's why we say faithful exercise of church discipline. You know, you can you can be a dictator with the binding and loosing. Um, I think it's Pastor Bob that told a story once. Maybe it was during a sermon about a. I think it was during a sermon about a pastor who would just excommunicate like all over the place, just for little things. Like if he didn't like you, or just you're out, get out of here, get out of here. Something. That's not faithful exercise of church. That would be. I would say that would be a reason to leave a church. That would be a reason to leave a church. Yeah. A abusive pastor in that way. Um, th this is. Uh, I have a quote on your sheet. Says Burkoff. Um, Calvin vigorously warns against all arbitrary separation. Even though something is lacking in the purity of doctrine or of the sacraments, even though the holiness of the life and the faithfulness of the ministers leaves much to be desired, one may not for that reason immediately leave the church. One has the duty to leave only when the high points of necessary doctrine or the foremost doctrines of religion have an exchange for a lie. So I, I, say, I say this to say, we, we all need to, in our own minds, be very careful when making that decision to leave a church. And um, the re most of us here will probably always be at, at this church uh, and won't leave for any little reason. We've been, all of us in this room have been here for a long time. Uh, so it, so I, I say this to, as you advise others, you know, um, it, it's important to advise others to, to be careful when making that decision. It's a... You don't just do it arbitrarily, is, is the point here. You don't just, oh, I don't really, you know, the pastor said something in a certain way that wasn't, that I didn't really agree with, so I'd rather just go over there. That's just not, that's not what you do. That's not what you do. Nick, the problem yes. with when you leave is you take yourself with you. Right. And, uh, <laughs> if you saw problems in Church A, you can find them in. C and B. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. As someone who left the church, you know, it was basically based on the fact that we seemed to resolve, you know, major abandonment of some of the doctrine mm -hmm. and teachings in the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a good decision. That was a that was a good decision there. Yeah. You, you didn't leave because the pastor dressed, uh, uh, no, you know, no. in, in a bow tie. You don't like bow ties. <laughs> I like bow ties. I, I, I like bow ties a lot. All right, let's deal with a couple practical concerns. Uh, church membership. Uh, go to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, 17, unless it's on your sheet. Is that on your sheet? All right. Church membership. Bible says all over the place are members of one another. Okay, but that itself doesn't prove church membership. Here's a quick argument for church membership. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. Okay. Notice the elders, the leaders here, are the ones who are giving an account for their flock. In other words, you need to know who your leaders are, and your leaders need to know who you are. So if you don't have a formal church membership of some sort, it can look differently in different places. There's a, the Bible never lays out this is exactly how it's supposed to look. But you as a leader, if you're going to give account for your people, have to know who your people are. That is the very basic, simple argument for church membership. You have to know who your sheep are. Okay? Therefore, um, as this passage says, you're keeping watch over their souls. So you have to know who they are. So therefore, um, membership should be um, 
a thing, and it should be formal in the sense of there should be a role. And how are you going to excommunicate someone if they've never been brought into something? How are you going to be a society without knowing who's in your society? I mean, you could go on and on with this. Um, basic, when you look to scripture to find a basic understanding of what the church is, you, you can't get around the fact that you're going to need some sort of church membership. It's just implied. You're not going to be able to get around it if you're going to be faithful to all, this, all that the Bible says about this. <clears throat> what, what about a person who attends, mm -hmm. even faithfully, but they, they're kind of a, a, almost a member. I mean, we call regular members. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they don't actually join the church. I mean, the church I grew up in, I never wound up joining it. I was an adult. Yeah, I didn't get married. And so it wasn't as if I was leaving a church I had made any vows to. We just began attending here. And after a time, mm -hmm. um, became members. Yeah. But I mean, what would you say to a person who faithfully attends but does not actually ever actually pull the trigger? And yeah. I, w I would just gently tell him what I just said. Yeah. And I would admonish him that it's important to be accountable to elders, um, not just from afar, or not just attend here, but to be an active member in the local church because the Bible makes uh, gives you responsibilities as a professing Christian, um, and to do them, you have to be an active member in the local body. So I would admonish him. Sam, Sam, you attended for a long time before you became a member, right? Yeah, this is a kind of hitting my home for me. That's when I actually came to this church in uh, 90, uh, 98. Uh, and a uh, recommendation for my daughter, mm -hmm. who had a girl she graduated from Cumberland College, so was in the church. We started coming here, and we were here at this church, and we were telling my daughter's family, oh, we were at their church. Mm -hmm. Okay, for all those years, okay, when we were part of her family, either we were here or we were there, and we felt very strong that if we became members, we would be here, okay, mm -hmm. active in the church. Yeah. So for all those years, okay, that we attended, we were not members here, and we won't come to go to church. Yeah. Okay, uh, but then we're going to pass. together and then we'll close up. It sort of summarizes a lot of what we spoke of today. <clears throat> and this is very old. We believe that we ought to discern diligently and very carefully by the word of God what is the true church. For all sects in the world today claim for themselves the name of, quote, the church. We are not speaking here of the company of hypocrites who are mixed among the good in the church and who nonetheless are not part of it even though they are physically there. But we are speaking of distinguishing the body and fellowship of the true church from all sects that call themselves the church. The true church can be recognized if it has the following marks. The church engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. 
It practices church discipline for correcting faults. In short, it governs itself according to the pure word of God, rejecting all things contrary to it and holding Jesus Christ as the only head. By these marks, one can be assured of recognizing the true church, and no one ought, and no one ought to be separated from it. As for those who can belong to the church, we can recognize them by the distinguishing marks of Christians, namely by faith and by their fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness, once they have received the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. They love the true God and their neighbors without turning to the right or left, and they crucify the flesh and its works. Though great weakness remains in them, they fight against it by the Spirit all the days of their lives, appealing constantly to the blood, suffering, death, and obedience of the Lord Jesus, in whom they have forgiveness of their sins through faith in Him. As for the false church, it assigns more authority to itself and its ordinances than to the Word of God. And may I just quickly remark, that is a great way to tell if there's a false church. That's a great way. So that's a good quote to memorize it. It does not want to subject itself to the yoke of Christ. It does not administer the sacraments as Christ commanded in His Word. It rather adds to them or subtracts from them as it pleases. It bases itself on humans more than on Jesus Christ. It persecutes those who live holy lives according to the Word of God and who rebuke it for its faults, greed, and idolatry. These two churches are easy to recognize and thus to distinguish from each other. Amen. Um, and, and really notice the end there. Uh, there is a lot of people with like discernment bloggers being a, a thing. Um, there is a lot of uh, people that some have made uh, heresy hunters, right? Where they do this weird association thing. Well, Keith has a cousin, right? who goes to this church where the pastor once attended Fuller Theological Seminary, where his professor was once, uh, uh, once said that, you know, um, Jesus didn't really have a real body, uh, so therefore, Keith is heretic. That might be a bit of exaggeration, but people do that sort of thing. A, a real example would be, he spoke at a conference with some people who don't believe good things, so therefore, he's a heretic too. He's communing with those guys, so he's a real Aren't you really talking about the visible and the invisible church here? What do you mean? I mean, well, this is it. this is talking more about the actual outward appearance of the church and how the church mm -hmm. functions. Okay. What the church teaches, you know. But there, I mean, there may be true believers in a congregation, and hopefully, the spirit will move them to. Yes, there are yeah, probably could, true could believers could be. in you know Roman Catholic churches yeah. and all different kinds of churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as far as this last statement, the two are easy to recognize. I, I'm just saying, let's not be heresy hunters and uh, yeah. be trying to find a way where someone is possibly a heretic, although they say the right things. Um, if it's really hard to discern if someone's a heretic, they, I mean, they might be, but maybe not. Yeah. It's just we got to be careful with that sort of thing. That's all. R.C. Sproul attended a pretty liberal seminary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, you just got to be careful when you call someone a heretic. It's a, it's a formal term. It's a really important term. Yeah. Uh, and it's a declarative term. 